Welcome to Railway Legends, Myths, and Stories. I'm Kevin Stanley. You may notice that we have made a slight update to our set. My wife likes me in these black shirts, and as a matter of fact, I like them as well. The problem was that our set has this black stove in it, and, well, sometimes it's hard to see where the fireplace ends and I begin. Lisa did not want me to change shirt color, and the fireplace flashing was a bit dinged up anyway, so she repainted it. We'll see how this works out. In this episode, I will talk about railway track and its gauge. We have come to one of the subjects that helped get this video project started. For the longest time, Lisa and I have been asked why are rail tracks laid the way they are. We both studied on this in different ways and mostly kept coming back to the same basic idea. I hope I can give you some kind of an answer. So let's take a look at the placement of the rails and how far apart they came to be. I previously have talked of the different kinds of tramways and wagonways. These first tracks were often made of wood or stone or a combination of both. Then there were plateways of iron and then came steel rails. Now I will be talking of the rails as we have them today. What I want to get into now is the size, that is the width or the gauge of the track. But before I go on, it might be a good idea to explain what rail gauge is. Rail gauge or track gauge is the inside measurement between the two rails on which the wheels of the train ride. So how was gauge decided? Just what was it that made one width or another better? One myth about track gauge, and you'll see this in many places, asserts that it's based on the distance between Roman chariot wheels. Even this venerable tome, The Lore of the Train, which we have used many times as a reference, slips into this myth. On page 53, the book says, the commonest rail gauge was 1,435 millimeters, which was not only that of the old colliery lines in northeastern England, but even approximate to the wheel width of the Roman roads in the days of the Caesars. Another often stated myth is that the rocks had been worn down by Roman chariot wheels, so it was simpler to lay rails in them. These are just strange myths. There is no evidence for this. These are often quoted and retold tall tales, legends, or myths, you might say. The size of a cart, a wagon, and even a modern high-speed rail passenger car mostly has to do with the size of the people. There is no sign, no data, and no credible reference that any of the wagonways, tramways, or plateways had anything to do with the Romans. Also, there is no evidence that Roman wagons were built to a standard design. So when you see this Roman wagons or chariot myth, take it as a good story, but don't take it as fact. Besides, remember that the Romans were big on marching, not riding in wagons. All right, how did the first builders of track decide on the gauge? The various collieries and mines, because they didn't connect to each other, tended to build things their own way. Whoever was the engineer at hand decided, or the gauge was set, to that of equipment that might have been acquired from another operation. As I have discussed in earlier episodes, early wagon and plateways were built to handle wagons that could also operate away from the rails on plain roads, so their gauge came from the width of the wagon's wheels, which leads to the question, which came first, the wagon or the road? Perhaps we'll look at that question another day. The statement from the lore of the train that many colliery lines were close to the 1435 millimeter gauge is correct. Or rather, it's sort of the case, at least as far as the lines built by George Stevenson or had Stevenson built locomotives. On the other hand, some were built to a gauge of 1422 millimeters. Why 1422 millimeters? because one of the first lines on which Stevenson worked happened to be that measurement. Remember what I said earlier, at some time or another somebody said the gauge will be... and that was that. Yes, 
And it's as simple as that. Early on, Stevenson had built a locomotive to build on a colliery line that happened to be 1,422 millimeters. Almost at once, Stevenson found that his locomotive was binding on parts of the line. The simplest and quickest fix was to widen the gauge. Look at our video, First Steam Railroads, for more about Stevenson's work with early locomotives. So, is there a single standard gauge? Well, let's see. Because there were so many rail lines that followed the leads started by Stevenson, there were a growing number of lines using that gauge. Later, as more and more lines were linked together, the 1435 millimeter gauge became a de facto standard. Another way this gauge was adopted was by the Stevenson Company building locomotives for export. These locomotives were built and tested on Stevenson's lines, then sent to other places, some in North America. It was often the case that the new railway needed the locomotive to help build the line and thus the line was built to the locomotive's gauge. Through the export from the British Isles and later the many companies of North America, there was a widespread export to a great deal of the rest of the world. This was the main spread of what was called the Stevenson Gauge. Do understand that the father and son team of George and Robert Stevenson were held in such esteem that some, like for example the Boston and Lowell Railway, were for the most part basically copies of how things were built on the Stevenson engineered Liverpool and Manchester. Thus, the most common gauge in the world is 1435 millimeters. This is used all over Britain, most of Europe and North America, much of South America, China, and a great deal of the rest of Asia, as well as parts of Africa and some of Australia. But while I said most common, this is only by a slight margin, as only about 55% of the world's railways use the 1435 millimeter gauge. Also in use is a gauge of 1524 millimeters. Uh, this is obviously broader than the Stevenson gauge of 1435 millimeters. The 1524 gauge is used throughout Russia and those other countries such as Finland that were connected to Russia by rail during the early development of railways in the time of the Russian Empire. The vast area under Russian control ensured that this would be used by not only Russia but the many countries on its borders. One of the other and even broader mainline gauges in the use today is the 1676 millimeter gauge lines on the Indian subcontinent. Close to that is the 1668 millimeters, and some sources have slightly different values, often called the Iberian gauge used throughout Spain and Portugal. Another widely used gauge today is 1067 millimeters. This gauge is used throughout Japan and New Zealand, except the Japanese high speed network is 1435 millimeters. Many other places also use the 1067 millimeter gauge. Here we see three rails. These are places in Japan that have both the 1435 high speed lines and the traditional 1067 millimeter gauge on the same trackway. This bit of dual gauge track gives you some idea of the difference in size. These days, almost nowhere in the world do railway gauges come out to a round number in any measuring system. Well, I did say almost. In Switzerland, there is a fair bit of meter gauge track, 1,000 millimeters. Seems to every rule there is an exception. The Iberian gauge of 1668 millimeters is based on an older measurement system, but there has been some drift. The Russian gauge might have been held to an old Russian imperial measurement as well, but instead it was set by an engineer from Scotland, and this engineer had new ideas, and once again, after time, the gauge drifted to what it is today. The Russians intentionally wanted a gauge that was different from the countries to the west of them. For national defense reasons, they did not want other countries' trains to be able to run on their tracks. We'll come back to this story later. Over the years, there have been both wider and narrower gauges. Transit systems, especially those not intended to be interchanged with other systems, may have more variety. For example, the Bay Area Rapid Transit System in California has a gauge of 1,676 millimeters. On the narrower side, Helsinki's tram network is 1,000 millimeters, while Sweden has some suburban railways that are a mere 891 millimeters. <laughs> 
At other times, a very large gauge is needed for very large arrangements, like the Very Large Array Radio Telescope in New Mexico. While technically it is 1435 gauge, it is worked by two parallel lines of 1435 millimeters track to give enough width to support the huge dishes. Yes, yes, I can hear some of you saying, hey Kevin, what about Brunel? Yes, there was Brunel and the Great Western Railway that used an enormous gauge of 2,134 millimeters. I hope to go into a lot more about the Great British Gauge War of Brunel versus Stevenson soon. There were also the very narrow gauge lines, such as in Maine in the USA, but those are also a story for another time. What I want to leave you with is that though there are a number of gauges, what sort of standard that there is has come slowly into being, mostly because there was more of one gauge than another, and mainly because it was more efficient to have a network of interconnected railways using the same gauge. From the study I have made of rail gauge, most often early rail gauges, or those of lines being built in new areas not connected to other networks, were picked out of happenstance. In a future episode, we will go into the conflicts of different gauges in the early days of railroading. If you would like to hear more about the differences in rail systems, please let us know. Oh, and also, unless you're a train, stay off the tracks, whatever the gauge. And as always, we'll see you on the train. <laughs>